Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Design Your Own Airplanes. In this video, we're going to be learning about lift-induced drag force. For those of you who are new to the channel, these videos are dedicated to explaining and demonstrating aerospace engineering principles so that you can design and build your own model airplanes that actually fly. In an earlier video, we learned how to build a simple and inexpensive glider, similar to this one, that you can use to experiment with different airplane designs. If you haven't built one yet, I've put a link in the description to the build video. In our earlier videos, we learned that drag is a force that acts on our planes in the opposite direction that they're flying. We also learned about parasite drag, which comes from the pressure of the air on an object as it is deflected around it, as well as from friction between the air and the surface of the object. This time, we're going to be learning about a second type of drag called lift-induced drag, or just induced drag. This type of drag is created as a byproduct of producing lift force. In this video, we're going to learn four things. First, we're going to learn how induced drag is created. Second, we're going to learn how to design our planes to minimize the induced drag force, and we'll do a real-life experiment to demonstrate the difference. Third, we'll discuss a few things you can do to design your wings to be more efficient. And finally, we'll take a look at how to use ground effect to get an extra boost at the end of your flight. In our last video about lift force, we talked about how lift is created through a combination of high pressure force acting on the bottom of an airfoil and low pressure force acting on the top, creating a net upwards force. So far, however, we've been working with two-dimensional airfoils. Two-dimensional airfoils are often referred to as infinite wings, implying that they have no wingtips. The situation changes, however, when we start working with three-dimensional wings, or finite wings, that do have wingtips. We'll start by looking at an airplane from the front. As before, there is high pressure on the bottom of the wing and low pressure on the top. Now, however, we have a problem. Air always flows from high pressure to low pressure. This means that at the wingtips, the high pressure air underneath the wing spills over into the low pressure region above the wing. Air spilling over from the bottom to the top of the wing creates a swirling vortex at each wingtip similar to a small tornado. In this picture, a wingtip vortex can be seen when an airplane is flown through a cloud of smoke. Wingtip vortices do two things that hurt our plane's flight performance. First, they make our lift force weaker, and second, they produce additional drag force. Drag force produced by wingtip vortices is called induced drag. Now that we know the detrimental effects of wingtip vortices, let's take a look at exactly how they happen. First, when we look at the airflow over the wing, we'll notice that the wingtip vortices redirect it downwards. The downwards component of the airflow that is added by the wingtip vortices is called downwash. This is a problem for us because, as we talked about in our previous video about lift force, redirecting the airflow downwards was supposed to have been the airfoil's job. Since the wingtip vortice is doing some of the work instead, there's therefore less work for the airfoil to do to redirect the airflow downwards, and therefore the equal and opposite upwards force on the wing is weaker. Another way to think about this is that the wingtip vortices effectively decrease the angle of attack. As we talked about in our lift force video, the angle of attack is the angle between the free stream and the cord line, and greater angles of attack produce greater lift coefficients and more lift force. When we add downwash into the free stream, however, the angle of attack is effectively reduced. This means that we will have a lower lift coefficient and less lift force. We can see the effects of wingtip vortices on the lift coefficient in the lift curve graph. The lift curve of the finite wing, shown in red, is less steep and has smaller lift coefficients than the infinite wing, shown in green. Now that we've learned how wingtip vortices reduce lift force, let's talk about how they create drag force. First, we'll look back at our downwash diagram. By definition, the lift force acts at a right angle to the free stream. When we add downwash, however, not only is the free stream tilted downwards, but the lift force vector is angled backwards as well. This creates a component of the lift force that acts in the opposite direction the plane is flying. This backwards component of the lift force is called induced drag force. We can see the effect of wingtip vortices on the drag coefficient in this graph, called a drag polar, 
where the drag coefficient is shown for different lift coefficients. The drag coefficient of a finite wing is greater for a given lift coefficient than that of an infinite wing. In summary, the pressure difference between the top and bottom of the wing produces wingtip vortices. Wingtip vortices create downwash, and downwash causes induced drag and reduces lift. The wingtip vortices are bad, the downwash is bad, and the induced drag is bad. All of this reduces the lift force, which makes it more difficult to keep our planes airborne, and it creates extra drag. As we talked about in our video about basic glider physics, more drag force means our planes can't fly as far. This brings us to the question, what can we do to reduce the induced drag force? To answer this, we're going to have to take a look at the equation for the induced drag coefficient. The induced drag coefficient is calculated by the equation shown here. The total drag coefficient is equal to the sum of the induced drag coefficient and the parasite drag coefficient, which we learned about in our video about parasite drag. Let's start taking this apart and see what we can do to reduce the induced drag. The first thing we'll notice is that the induced drag coefficient is smaller when the lift coefficient decreases. In our previous video about lift force, we learned that as you fly slower, you have to increase your lift coefficient to stay airborne. This means that the induced drag force on your plane decreases as you fly faster and increases when you fly slower. In contrast, as we learned in our video about parasite drag, the parasite drag force increases as you fly faster and decreases as you fly slower. Now that we know the relationship between speed and induced drag, let's look at how we can design our planes to produce as little induced drag as possible. The first thing we can do to minimize the induced drag coefficient is to increase the aspect ratio. The aspect ratio is a measure of how long and skinny an airplane's wing is. The aspect ratio is calculated by dividing the square of the plane's wingspan, b, by its wing area, s. Planes with high aspect ratios, like this one, have very long and skinny wings. Planes with low aspect ratios, on the other hand, have short, stubby wings. A higher aspect ratio means that a greater portion of the wing is further away from the wingtip vortices. Therefore, there is less downwash in this region. In this diagram, we can see two wings viewed from the front, one with a low aspect ratio on top and one with a high aspect ratio on the bottom. When we look at the downwash, shown in red, we can see that at the center of the wings, the downwash is weaker on the high aspect ratio wing since it is further from the wingtip vortices. The weaker downwash means that the high aspect ratio wing will have less induced drag. In these drag polars, we can see how increasing the aspect ratio reduces the drag coefficient. In these lift curves, we can see how increasing the aspect ratio increases the slope of the lift curve as well. Putting the graphs and equations aside, we can demonstrate the effect that the aspect ratio has on the distance that our planes fly by trying it for real. In this experiment, we'll compare two wings. The first wing has an aspect ratio of only 4.4. The second wing has an aspect ratio of 10. In this experiment, both planes have been adjusted to fly the maximum distance possible, and a catapult is used to ensure ideal launch conditions for each. The plane with an aspect ratio of 4.4 was able to fly a distance of 35 feet. The plane with an aspect ratio of 10, however, was able to fly a distance of 45 feet. Increasing the aspect ratio, however, does create some problems of its own. First, longer, skinnier wings are more flimsy. When the wings bend too much, it can be difficult to get your plane to fly straight, and the wings might even break. Second, longer wings have more rotational inertia, and therefore, planes with higher aspect ratios are less maneuverable. Planes that need to be quick and agile, like fighter jets, usually have low aspect ratio wings. Increasing your aspect ratio is by far the most effective thing you can do to reduce your induced drag force, but there are a few other things you can do that might help as well. If we look back at the induced drag coefficient equation, we can see that we have a term called the Oswald span efficiency factor. The span efficiency factor is a measure of how efficient a wing is, but to understand exactly what it's measuring, we'll need to take a look at the downwash again. 
This diagram shows the ideal situation in which a wing is most efficient. The amount of downwash, shown in red, is the same across the entire wingspan. We can also see that the strength of the lift force, shown in green, is distributed in the shape of an ellipse, which is a fancy word for an oval. The span efficiency factor is given as a number between 0 and 1 and functions as a measure of how closely the lift and downwash distributions of a given wing match the ideal case. A value of 1 indicates that the lift and downwash distributions perfectly match the ideal case and the wing is as efficient as it can possibly get. A value close to 0, however, indicates that the lift and downwash distributions are very far from ideal. One thing we can do to increase the span efficiency factor is to taper the wings so that the wing tip cord is shorter than the wing root cord. The taper of a wing is measured by the taper ratio, which is calculated by dividing the tip cord by the root cord. The ideal taper ratio for maximum efficiency is usually somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4. This diagram shows a rectangular wing with a taper ratio of 1 on top and a tapered wing with a taper ratio of one-third on the bottom, both viewed from the front. We can see that the tapered wing redistributes the downwash from the wing tips to the middle of the wing. This results in a downwash and lift distribution that more closely resemble the ideal case and increases the span efficiency factor. Designing the wing in the shape of an ellipse makes for an almost perfectly elliptical lift distribution and constant downwash across the wingspan. In this drag polar, we can see how tapered and elliptical wings have lower drag coefficients compared to rectangular ones, although the difference is very small. Another thing that's sometimes done to improve the span efficiency factor is to design a twist into the wings so that the wing tips are at a slightly lower angle of attack than the wing root. One final strategy to reduce the induced drag is to try to weaken the wingtip vortices themselves. We can do that by adding small fins, called winglets, onto the ends of our wings, like these ones. Winglets make the wingtip vortices smaller, which means that there is less downwash and therefore less induced drag. In these downwash diagrams, we can see that the wing with winglets on the bottom has less downwash than the one without winglets on top. Keep in mind though, that although winglets reduce the induced drag, they are also another source of parasite drag, so they might not reduce your drag force overall. In this drag polar, we can see the effects of adding winglets. At high lift coefficients, where the induced drag is strong, we can see that the reduction in induced drag makes for lower total drag coefficients. You might also notice, however, that at low lift coefficients, where the induced drag is relatively weak, the reduction in induced drag is outweighed by the increase in parasite drag and makes for a slightly higher total drag coefficient. Before we end the video, we have one last topic to cover, and that is ground effect. When an airplane is flying very close to the ground, such as during takeoff and landing, the wingtip vortices are significantly weaker. This results in less downwash, less induced drag, and more lift than in mid-flight. Ground effect gets stronger as a plane flies lower and usually becomes noticeable when a plane is less than half a wingspan off the ground. We can see where our gliders go into ground effect in the final segments of their flights. The glide slope gets shallower and they fly a little bit further because the induced drag force gets weaker. Looking back at our aspect ratio experiment from earlier, another reason that the plane with the high aspect ratio was able to fly further was because it had a larger wingspan than the plane with the low aspect ratio, and therefore it got a bigger boost from ground effect at the end. That wraps it up for this video. We've learned how wingtip vortices and downwash create induced drag and reduce lift. We've learned to design planes with high aspect ratios to minimize induced drag. We've learned to add taper and winglets to our planes to make them more efficient. And we've learned how to get a boost from ground effect. In our next video, we're going to put everything we've learned over the last few episodes together and learn to design our planes to fly as far as possible. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos, and thanks for watching.